All right, well, let's, uh, let's continue on. I'd like to give just a little bit of a uh, background again. Just kind of what have we been talking about? Kind of a summary. Uh, first, <clears throat> I, I've emphasized a couple of things. One is the framework that Luther's Reformation activity is animated by, a, uh, uh, by concerns over bad pastoral care. And pastoral care encompasses both priestly and non-priestly Geistlichkeiten or spiritual practices. And you can see that almost in a programmatic fashion, Luther takes up each of those things that are the most popular and writes treatises on them or reforms them or changes them. Okay? Um, and so it's, it's also a, a way in which to under... Often Luther is described as a non-systematic theologian that he's an occasional theologian because he seems like he's shooting from the hip at all sorts of different places. But, it, but if you look at it this way, these treatises, uh, they don't have logical coherence in terms of a systematic theology, but they do make sense if you see them as responses to uh, these popular practices that people are utilizing. So all of a sudden, you know, that list that I put up there, you see Luther is actually kind of programmatically taking things out until finally he gets to culminate with um, the scriptures until he's disillusioned by the fact that uh, it didn't work and he's got to write his catechisms, right? Uh, so uh, I think there's a sense in which Luther's, Luther's program is also a bit naive into thinking that if I just get it out there in German, everyone will read it and then they'll, they'll all be taught of God, right? And then he, of course, visits them and realizes that nobody knows anything. Um, and so... Uh, he obviously doesn't give up on the scriptures, but realizes there needs to be a lot more helps along the way. Um, so that's the first thing uh, that we, we talked about. The other thing is Luther's monastic context is very important, both in, in terms of the fact that, that there's been an effort, in, especially in his order, to uh, teach lay people certain ideals of monastic piety. And secondly, that Luther is, <clears throat> Luther is bringing some of those central places, uh, central themes in monastic piety, like humility and penitence, and, and now making it part of the whole Christian life. Think again about thesis number one of the 95 Theses. That basically the ideal that the whole life of a, of a Christian is one of repentance and of a penitent is very much the monastic uh, ideal. Semper penitence, always a penitent, of course, is a, in some sense, is a thematic precursor to simul justus et peccator, isn't it? The recognition that there isn't a moment, and it's, it's, a, it's a devastating theme against works righteousness. The idea that one could finally kind of pick themselves up on their own bootstraps and be righteous runs counter to this idea that no matter how far you progress, you still have to confess that you're, you have sins to, that need forgiven. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux is probably your most significant monastic, you know, proper monastic writer that has this theme of semper penitence. And Luther is a, a strong adherent of Bernard, especially early on. Um, but, uh, uh, so Luther addresses this, and he moves... Um, monasticism, rather than an uh, inward-looking thing, becomes an external uh, uh, force that embraces uh, all of Christendom. Staupitz is part of that process, etc. But now, how is it that Luther gets there? Um, so Luther writes his own version, his own understanding of faith, into these different new texts of the Ars Moriendi, the 14 Consolations, Meditations on the Passion of Christ. And beca because he does this with a redefinition of, of religious life as faith rather than love, it changes the boundary lines of what it means to be a religious person. So uh, if you think about it, being religious is defined by the vows externally and internally by the particular virtues that are cultivated, all summarized in, in terms of love. Luther, uh, because he sees the word as um, 
requiring faith and faith alone as the characteristic of, of what it means to be religious changes all of those boundaries. Those traditional characteristics of what it means to be religious are, are relativized. So you're not defined externally by pious and charitable works or solemn vows, nor are you defined internally by virtues such as love or humility or purity. Religious people are now determined entirely by the word that gives rise to faith. And so his reforms are aimed at presenting this this foundation of religious life to all of Christianity. with This German Bible and the Marginalia, the Ein Klein Unterricht, this, this brief introduction on what to expect when you, find the, when you read the Gospels. His postal literature that he writes at the Wartburg, uh, again, is sort of trying to give samples for people to see when you hear a Christmas story, what does an evangelical Christmas story sermon sound like? Um, and then even, you know, the reorientation of worship into preaching. Remember I said how preaching is actually not the central feature of the divine service, but is something that people do outside of it. Now he has reorient the central purpose is no longer the sacrifice of the mass or any kind of sacrificial act, um, but it is the proclamation of the word and everything else then it becomes sort of a, a s centered around that, including the sacramental life is, is centered around the word. The heart of the sacraments are the promises that are connected to the elements. Um, he, even, he even democratizes the old monastic Lectio Divina, uh, which we'll talk, I'll, I'll talk about that more concretely. Um, and, uh, and offers his own version of the, of the daily offices, in a, in a certain sense, um, that, are, that are oriented to the laity and that are shaped by lay life. So that lay life, uh, lay Christian life isn't a, a um, it's not monasticism light. Uh, but it is uh, really the true shape of monasticism if it's shaped by the word of God. So some people say that Luther sort of uh, embraces lay Christianity and becomes a layman. I think it's the opposite, that he, that he has basically made the entire church mendicant. Um, uh, in a way that none of the monks could do before uh, because of his new definition of what it means truly to be religious. We'll come back to that theme in a bit. So how did Luther get there? I, we talked at the end about Romans, right? And, and, um, and the distinction of long gospel is a, a key distinction. Um, and you'll see why it's a distinction in light of this other aspect. So, so for, for Luther, the Antipelagian writings really clarifies for him the relationship of the law to the gospel. And if you've ever read Augustine's On the Spirit in the Letter, it's hard not to read it thinking that Augustine maybe had read Walther. Um, <clears throat> now, now it's, granted, it's a misreading if we do that, but it sounds so, it, the themes are so familiar to us when we read uh, Augustine's On the Spirit in the Letter that you can't help but think, this guy gets long distinction of law and gospel. Well, this is kind of where Luther gets it from. Uh, Luther reads that, and, and of course, he doesn't replicate Augustine. He, he makes it his own in the context of interpreting Paul in Romans and Galatians. Um, so that's one source. But the other, which he encounters also at the same time, is, is mystical, German mystical theology. And I mentioned, I put on the board, uh, or on the, on the projector there a little earlier, this Theologia Deutsch, right, this German theology. And he publishes that in 1516, the first time. And it's an incomplete version that he finds. And he puts a little preface to it. And he publishes it in 1516. And he thinks it's by uh, a, a theologian, a Dominican theologian named Johannes Tauler. Um, evidently, that's Tauler on the left. Uh, he, thinks, he thinks it's by Towler, and he, because he had started reading Towler's sermon. One of his friends, Johannes Lang, gave him a copy of some published sermons of Towler. And, uh, and Luther started reading them, and then he also came across this, and he says, this is fantastic. He published it again, a full, complete version of the Theologia Deutsch, in, um, in 1518. 
and he writes a preface to it. And he says, this book is the best book on true Christian theology apart from St. Augustine and the scriptures themselves. So this is, in terms of, in terms of trying to find out the, the heart of, of what it means to be a Christian, uh, this book is better than anything I've ever read uh, excepting scripture and Augustine. High praises. He has the same kind of praise of Towler. No theologian, except for maybe St. Augustine, is more insightful and understands uh, the nature of theology uh, than Johannes. Just a quick question, has this been fully translated into English? There, yes, there, is, uh, there are various translations of German theology. I'll, I'll put some excerpts up here for just to experience them a little bit. But what is it about Tauler and the Theologia Deutsch that Luther likes so much? Has anybody ever read Towler or familiar with Towler at all? So he's part of the, he is deeply influenced by Meister Eckhart. Anybody heard of Meister Eckhart before? Okay, so Meister Eckhart, there's a, there is, um, there's, uh, in the late Middle Ages, there's a variety of forms of mysticism. And one that is kind of lowland mysticism that starts in, in the Netherlands, but also incorporates a lot of German writings. Um, tends to focus on a, a uh, there's sort of two themes. The one that's most famous for is this kind of getting lost into the divinity, like losing your identity. The famous way that Eckhart talks about it is like becoming one with God is like, um, is like a drop of wine in the sea. Oh, sounds like Hinduism. Well, yeah, so, so you, you, there, there's this sense in which the, the, um, the distinction between creature and creator seem to be lost, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a main theme to the point that some of Meister Eckhart's writings were, were questioned of whether they were orthodox or not. And he always maintained they were, and he was never really condemned a heretic. But So Tyler's influenced by this too. And you're like, wow, that's, that thought about, about kind of losing yourself in God just doesn't sound like Luther at all. Why would he be interested in this? Well, while that theme is there, there's another theme that's very po uh, uh, important, and it's very dominant in, in Tauler and in Theologia Deutsch. And it is, it's, um, the phrase is vernichtheit. Uh, basically, it means annihilation. Um, this, the, the function of, now it sounds like it's very similar to this losing yourself and the creator to become annihilated. But um, the way Towler talks about it, he talks about how important it is to first become nothing before God can make something out of you. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's taking not only humility, but all of our spiritual angst in which we think God is distant and making that actually part of the way in which God saves us. And if you understand what Luther was struggling with, you, you've seen the movies, of course, and Joseph Fiennes does a pretty decent job of this, where he's sort of in, to, being tortured because God seems to be against him, right? He's made him just to damn him. And he's angry with him. He hates him. And of course, if God didn't make him to damn him, being angry and hating him will definitely get him put in hell. So he's really in trouble. And, and, uh, and he feels like the devil is closer than God. Uh, and, and, that, and that God is distant and his prayers just end in, in nothingness. And that becomes this point. Has God abandoned me? What Towler does is he teaches Luther that that experience of abandonment is actually the means by which God brings about salvation. In other words, don't see the, abandon, the experience of abandonment and distance of God as a genuine expression of God's abandonment and his distance from you, but is the means by which he brings, builds you up. So I'm gonna give you some quotes and then we'll try, to, we'll try to look at kind of how Luther appropriates them and see how it fits in our larger framework in a way we, we probably don't, we probably don't, we are not used to using this language, but there's a, there's a history of this language that's found in Luther's thought. So these are actually quotations from, um, 
from Theologia Deutsch. Um, so the Christian should acknowledge of a truth that in himself he, is, he neither hath nor can do any good thing, and that none of his knowledge, wisdom, and art, his will, love, and good works come from himself, nor are of man, nor of any creature, but that they are all of the eternal God from whom they all proceed. As Christ himself says, without me, you can do nothing. So this is Theologia Deutsch. There is nothing that we possess that is our own. All comes from God. We're empty-handed. Okay, Luther's with him. He's experienced that. Therefore, although it be good and profitable that we should ask and learn and know what good and holy men have wrought and suffered and how God had dealt with them and what he wrought in and through them, yet it were a thousand times better that we should in ourselves learn and perceive and understand who we are, how and what our life is, what God is and is doing in us, what he will have from us, and to what ends he will or will not make use of us. What's that distinction? What's he contrasting? On the one hand, it's good to learn about how God deals with people. And where do you learn about that mostly? In the Bible, right? You hear the stories of how God deals with Abraham and the prophets and Daniel and John the Baptist and the disciples. But it's a thousand times better to have that actual experience yourself, right? Um, so what's, what, what's sitting here is this contrast between uh, what, what in uh, theology is called fetus historica, um, the faith of historical events versus the, uh, the saving faith. So the objective versus subjective, the notion that, as Luther would say, it's not enough to know that Christ died on the cross. You got to know that he died for me. For you, right? This pro nobis side of things focuses on the subjective side of things. You can't just everybody's sort of familiar with the story of salvation, but you have to know that the story of salvation is for you, and not just know it's for you, as he says in the epistle in his lectures on Hebrews. Not just that Christ is for you, but that he comes to you. Or he'll use the language of Bernard of Clairvaux. It's not enough that Christ was born in history; he must be born spiritually in you. And in fact, it's entirely for the sake of the spiritual birth in the heart by faith that Christ was born in history. He says, if Christ is not born in you by faith, Christ's physical birth is in vain. So that emphasis, uh, that distinction, Luther doesn't get it from here, but it reinforces, Bernard of Clairvaux uses it and he uses it. It's a monastic distinction to point to the pro nobis side of exegesis. Yeah. Nevertheless, we're not talking here about classic enthusiasm, are we? Of course not. Yeah. I don't know what you mean by classic enthusiasm. They're talking about God in me and, and uh, all of I, I also see in here an un, under, under theme of, of God, God doing all of the doing, uh, we doing nothing at all. Well, anything that we do is God working in us, right? And, and, and that's the, sort of the Philippians passage, to will and to do is good. Um, it's a classic Augustinian passage. Right. I, we'll come back to this notion. I don't want to too quickly say, of course it's not enthusiasm. Of course it's not enthusiasm, but I think sometimes we have over, overplayed our hand uh, on what we mean by enthusiasm and what Luther means by Christ being in us. Right. Christ's soul must, dis now here's, this is really, this is, this is the key here. Christ's soul must descend into hell before it ascends into heaven. So also must the soul of man. But mark ye in what manner this comes to pass. When a man truly perceives and considers himself who he is, what he is, finds himself utterly vile and wicked and unworthy of all the comfort and kindness that he's ever received from God, it seems to him that he shall be eternally lost and damned. This is what is meant by true repentance for sin. And he who is in this present time enters into this hell. And then he enters afterward into the kingdom of heaven. Now God hath not forsaken a man in this hell, but he is laying his hand on him that the man may not desire nor regard anything but the eternal good only. God's doing this on purpose 
so that everything that you used to hold your hands onto has been stripped away, so that now all you can do is a desire the eternal good only, and then when man neither careth for it, nor seeketh, nor desire anything but the eternal good alone, and seeks not himself, nor his own things, but only the honor of God, he is then made a partaker of all manner of joy, bliss, peace, rest, and consolation, and so the man is henceforth in the kingdom of heaven. This hell and this heaven are two good, safe ways for a man in this present time, and happy is he who truly finds them. Luther talks about this in Bondage of the Will. He said, I was, uh, I had resigned myself to my eternal damnation. And at that moment, I didn't realize how close I was to my salvation. When no longer you seek for your own benefit, but only for God's purposes and will, even if it means you're being cut off. Like Paul says in Romans, I, I think we read it this morning, I wish that I were cut off, right? So that God's people. Yeah. Well, like we were just talking about, you know, you know people are damned by... Uh, searching for good works for salvation because no one believes that they're going to, they're going to be saved by right. bad works. Right, right, yeah, right. Evil works are not in the running. For yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, that's why good works are detrimental to salvation. For exactly. That, uh, at least that's what, that's what rang in my ears. Right, right. So, but look at how this is. So Luther's experience now is given language to say, look, my experience of my hell is not an experience of God's abandonment, but it's God's intentional laying his hand upon me so that I might only hold on to him and not hold on to anything else, and then he may raise me up. It's creatio ex nihilo. God makes out of nothing, so he's got to make us nothing. He kills us, so he makes us alive. And the paradigm for this, of course, is Christ himself, right? So Christ is not an example. He's an exemplar. He's the, he's, he shows us, he, is, he, he shows us how, because God deals with him in this way, he shows us how we're going to be dealt with as well. And so now here's Luther. Listen to the echoes, not understanding, reading, or speculation, but living, nay, dying, and being damned. That's what makes a theologian. The word shines in a dark place, indeed a very dark place. Ultimately, God cannot be God unless he becomes the devil beforehand. And we cannot come into heaven unless we first have gone to hell. And then, um, so now how do we understand this in a non-mystical sense, you know, in, in, a, in an enthusiastic sense? Um, because this happens at the same time that he understands the distinction of law and gospel, that the law is about exposing our impotence, this becomes the existential description of what the law does. So remember, Pelagius says, why would God give us the Ten Commandments if he, if he didn't expect us to obey it? I mean, the fact that God gave us a law uh, assumes that we have the ability. Otherwise, God is a tyrant. Why would God demand for us to do something if he knew we couldn't do it? Uh, and so his saying is, you know, cursed is he who would say God would give a law that one cannot fulfill. And Augustine's answer is like, well, there might be a reason. The reason he gives us a law that we cannot fulfill is that we would no longer rely upon ourselves after experiencing our moral incapacity and we would flee to Christ, right? And this now is the, this, his experience now is given language from this mystical person in the context of understanding the role of the law. The role of the law is this killing function. Yeah. Uh, if I'm jumping ahead in your lecture, forgive me. But as, as, as you're speaking, I can't help but go to the, go to, go to the catechism and go to, go to baptism, go to the third article, where, where I can do nothing. And, I cannot and, buy my own reason. And then also theology of annihilation if baptism is an annihil uh, not an not annihilation that we no longer exist, but annihilation in that the old Adam is drowned, drowned. and dies. So here, think about this context. The, the, the pastoral response of late medieval scholastic theology to the problem of feeling doubt that you can't, you're, you're, str you're striving to, you, I feel like I can't do enough. The pastoral response of late medieval theology is a, is a semi-Pelagian one, which says, I know you can't do enough, but do what you can, and God will fill in the rest. But Luther's response to that uh, ex nihilo. is ex nihilo, is that, is that actually keep going until you finally got nothing, and then finally at nothing, God can make something, right? 
So it's not God, God adding to whatever you contributed. It's precisely the, the experience of impotence, the experience of not being able to do what God has commanded. That is the first stepping stone. Of course, this is dangerous stuff. This is devil's favorite territory because at this point, the law may not come to an end and you might end in despair. You know, your two options are works righteousness, you know, a pride, I fulfilled the law, or I've never fulfilled the law and I never will, and you kill yourself. Um, but it's at that very hairline moment that God, the gospel is there to make that into, uh, that hell into a heaven, right? I'm just wondering, uh, I, agree, I agree with what you're saying. I'm just wondering how that stacks up with Luther's, in, in his catechism, when he regards the person not to torture themselves in confession but to confess those sins which are known or heavy. But it seems like there's some merit to that tentatio of, mm. of torturing yourself in, maybe not torturing yourself, but I mean, truly examining yourself. Um, maybe the translation, I, I don't know, the, the, the Triglata translation is, is better, I think, but it, Luther's not giving an out the way it sounds, uh, as if we should not examine ourselves fully. No, which sins are you to confess? Not all of them. No, the, the, the ones that trouble us most. The ones that trouble us most. So he's not giving you an out. He wants you to focus on the ones that trouble you. But, but don't create a kind of a false problem. I mean, the, the, the problem is this will happen to you regardless whether you prepare yourself. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of working my brain around what you're saying and what <coughs> Luther was saying. But uh, I think that our people he, when our people hear the ones that trouble us most, they hear, okay, well, I've got these top five and then I'm... Right. Or they, they hear, well, there's nothing that really bothers me too bad, so I'll just yeah. do it. Right, 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 right. I, I, I did cheat my wife, so uh, I guess nothing, nothing's, right. nothing's worse than that, so I got, I got that one. Yeah. Which means they haven't heard or experienced the law enough, right? Yeah. So they don't, they haven't been taught to... Uh, so, okay. When I say torture, I, I mean it's just a law. Mm -hmm. Not, mm -hmm. not as torture No, it comes from the outside, right? right? Uh, uh, and so this will come to the... the, uh, the uh, 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 lay person's Lexio Divina, Oratio Meditatio Tentatio is, is the end result, and it's not different than what we've been talking about. Yeah. I hate to be sound facetious, but this sounds like, the, like part of the program of a spiritual AA. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, I mean, if it's right, it's right. I don't care where it comes from. But no, I mean, you, you, you're... You're right. You don't go any place until you hit rock bottom, exactly. and this is hit, this is rock bottom. Oh, that's right, that's right. They're not reading Towler, unfortunately. In how, many, how many American how, Ameri how many American Lutherans want to even consider this as a possibility? Well, that's why you start a Fight Club instead of. Fight <laughs> Club. Uh, that's right. That's right. Don't talk about it. It's Fight Club. Listen to how Luther, now, it, in his explanations, his Resolutionis uh, in 1518, his explanations to the 95 Theses, he has a very important section, and in there he's ta he talks about Towler. Uh, so in his explanation to the 95 Theses, he talks about how important Towler is. He says there's no other theologian that's, again, he, says, he kind of repeats it again. And then he takes, <clears throat> he says, there's no other theologian that understands what it means to be cut off. And, and be able to describe how God is using that. And then uh, he goes into this uh, paragraph in which he takes like a, a Paul's, uh, I knew a man that went to the third heaven passage in 2 Corinthians. You remember this? This kind of autobiographical way in which Paul talks about having had this vision. He talks about himself this way, but it goes in the opposite direction. So listen, uh, I myself... And this is in his published explanations the 95 Theses. I myself knew a man who claimed that he had often suffered these punishments, these punishments that Towler's talking about. In fact, over a very brief period of time, yet they were so great 
and so much like hell that no tongue could adequately express them, no pen could describe them, no one who had not himself experienced them could not believe them. And so great were they that if they had been sustained or lasted for half an hour, even for one-tenth of an hour, he would have perished completely and all of his bones would have been reduced to ashes. At such a time, there is no flight, no comfort within or without, but all things accuse. And in this moment, strange to say, the soul cannot believe that it can ever be redeemed other than that the punishment is not yet completely felt. Yet the soul is eternal and is not able to think of itself as being temporal. And all that remains is the stark naked desire for help and a terrible groaning, but it does not know where to turn for help. And it's in this instance the person is stretched out with Christ so that all his bones may be counted and every corner of the soul is filled with the greatest bitterness, dread, trembling, and sorrow in such a manner that all these things last forever. He's describing his own experience. But again, what, ha- what, what he says is helpful with Towler is that Towler says, this isn't an example of God's forsaking you. This is the process by which God redeems you. Um, and so, uh, uh, again, you know, redeems you in the sense that you experience finally for the first time truly the absolute gratuity of God's promise in Jesus Christ, that it hangs out all outside of me. And there's nothing in me, there's no virtue in me, nothing that I can hang my hat on. I can, there's no, all I can hang my hat on is the, is the bare promise of Christ and what I have heard that he's done for me. <clears throat> and of course, uh, this is what stands behind the, all the theology in the Heidelberg Disputation as well. Um, this is from one of, this is an explanation to one of his theses that wisdom of the law is not evil. Without the theology of the cross, man misuses the best in the worst manner. So good works are detrimental to salvation, not because good works are bad, but because a theologian of glory misuses good works in the worst way. That is, he uses them as a means by which he's saved. Indeed, the law is holy. Every gift of God is good and everything that is created exceedingly good. But as stated above, he who has not been brought low reduced to nothing through the cross and suffering, takes credit for works and wisdom and does not give credit to God. He thus misuses and defiles the gifts of God. He who, however, who has emptied himself through suffering no longer does works, but knows that God works and does all things in him. For this reason, whether God does works or not, it is all the same to him. He neither boasts if he does good works, nor is he disturbed if God does not do good works through him. He knows that it's sufficient if he suffers, is brought low by the cross in order to be annihilated all the more. It is this that Christ says in John 3, you must be born anew. To be born anew, one must completely first die and then be raised up with the Son of Man. To die, I say, means to feel death at hand. And we see this in his theology of baptism in the Babylonian captivity where he says, I really would wish that people would immerse in baptism rather than sprinkle because... uh, because it shows what's actually happening in baptism. Christians don't need to be washed as much as they need to die. Right? Uh, so this is, uh, and, and one might say, look, this is early Luther. This is Luther's theology of suffering. He gets over this, doesn't he? No, he never gets over this. It's one of the marks of the church in the, on the councils in the churches. The cross, right? The crucifixion of the flesh. Uh, He does not get over that, um, that God is continually killing us and making us alive as we live out our baptism until it finally come, we finally bury the thing. Um, So let me pause there. There's a theology of suffering that's embedded in in long gospel. It's coming out of this monastic, out of this monastic mystical tradition. And he sees it as a way in which to make sense, not only of his own experience, but other people who are having this similar experience. Um, I mean, the danger, of course, is that you impose upon the rest of Christendom your very particular experience. On the other hand, he's, he's made it broad enough that the law, as it's preached, will do its thing without you kind of whipping yourself up into a frenzy. Yeah. The very first thing that, that, that you said there, um, your experience of suffering as placing it on to someone else, um, or how did you say it? 
to impose your own very personal experience as the as kind of the benchmark for for everyone else. That is the that is you put the finger on the pulse of the antinomian problem in the LCMS, I think, right there. We have an antinomian problem, huh? <laughs> uh, what are you referring to? Well, that chick dig scars. And, and, and chicks dig scars. Chicks dig scars. Yeah, the, the worse my past is, the more glory, glorified Christ. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what um, Ferdy and Steve Paulson used to call the negative theology of glory. Uh, what's her name? Uh, 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 who's the tat? Nadia Boltzweber. Nadia Boltzweber. So she was a Ferdy student, right? She studied under Ferdy and Paulson. And I talked to Paulson about this. Like, what's the deal with Nadia Weber? And I mean, this is, she's the extreme example of this sort of celebration of the broken so that grace can be all in all, right? And he, he says, and that was, and that's what Ferdy always used to call a, a negative theology of glory, which is that you celebrated in the, in, in suffering and brokenness rather than seeing it as an ironic means. To, so the, the suffering and cross is not the thing to be embraced as such, right? It's the means by which, uh, so a Christian can find good in it because of, what, of, of the resurrection, of the outcome. But you don't celebrate in brokenness as such. I, I remember when I was at Mequon, uh, I went to a Bible study and there were all these people sitting in a circle, which should have been a clue that something <laughs> weird was happening. <laughs> And, and so one person started telling their kind of testimony, and, and they started telling about, you know, they're basically confessing in front of the group. Right. And it was like the old game telephone, you know, where you go down the line, and, and each person got worse and worse and worse until, like, the last one was like a serial killer or something. And, <laughs> and it was like well, the worst that they were before the Lord entered into their, into their lives. Um, the better Christian they were. It becomes a contest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See it, and now I'm seeing this in some pulpits. But I think it's a, it's a natural, sinful inclination of us all. We, you know, we, we want to dwell in the, in the sewer uh, and, and also to tell our story of being washed clean because it takes Jesus out of the equation and makes us the shiny nugget. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so to answer your question, yes, that is that is the, what I see as the antinomian problem. Right. Maybe it's not a pure antinomian, and I don't understand. I don't understand what what is soft and hard about it, but um, that is the problem. No, I, I mean, I think that. And I don't even know if you, if you want to call it antinomianism. But I wouldn't call it anti. Well, yes and no. I mean, the theology of the cross and Heidelberg disputation doesn't make sense unless you distinguish long gospel. Right? Exactly. Right. Um, so that's why the thing that's the, the very first thesis is about the law of God being the most, the greatest gift. And of course, it ends with, with the love of God creating and not finding what, what's pleasing to it. Uh, um, so, uh, I mean, I do think what, what's interesting is these guys, uh, I, I know what you're describing now. Um, they often blame Ferdy as the problem for this. And Ferdy, Fer, Ferdy's got strengths and weaknesses, but this ain't it. I mean, in other words, F Ferdy condemned this sort of stuff partly just because Ferdy's a Norwegian, um, and, and so is Steve Paulson. I mean, they're all, they're all kind of pietists, right? So they're not going to be antinomians. Um, uh, but, but, uh, this is Pete death. I'm not bringing him up. I'm just saying. No, no, but I, I'm saying, so, so this, is, this is exactly right, though. This is, this is um, celebrating to uh, kind of back to the theme of suffering. Uh, the Heidelberg Disputation isn't uh, about ethics. It isn't about uh, aesthetics or ontology or epistemology or any of those things. It's not saying um, uh, your problem as a theologian of glory is you like kittens and sunsets and rainbows and God loves a, a, a criminal hanging from the gallows. No, that's, that's not a new definition of beauty that he's working with. Your problem is that you like to do good things and help Grandma Schmidt, and God wants you to put Grandma, push Grandma Schmidt in front of a bus. It's not like it's inverting ethics. Right. It's Hamar theology. It's showing how the sinner will take the best and misuse it and create a religion out of it, ascribe divinity to created things. And, and so you can just as much cre create a religion. I mean, it's, it's a warped, uh, ma uh, masochistic sort of approach. Yeah. 
you know, where you ascribe a religion to suffering. I understand, you know, pressuring coal into a diamond. As long as the diamond doesn't go, hey, man, I used to be a piece of coal. Right, 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 right. Or that, that being a coal is really where it's at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and while you were reading those things, I kind of thought of the German pietist who, like, actual German pietism, that was like, you haven't gone far enough yet. Right. And, and the ones that, like, keep almost taking this too far and saying, you have to go a little deeper. You have to go a little deeper. So this isn't a method to pursue. This is a message to those who already experience it, right? So Luther's speaking out from, from the perspective of having experienced seeing others who experience it. And when he deals with things like, uh, I mean, his expectations are, if you truly hold on to the scriptures and hold on to the gospels, you will find a conflict that will contradict every promise that you found in the scriptures. Uh, it'll, it'll happen. And so then you have a choice. Do you believe what you're experiencing or do you believe the word of promise? Right. Well, any other thoughts on, on, on suffering, on kind of what's, what's being set forth here? It is it's kind of the... the uh, hand-wringing version of the distinction of long gospel early on, that Luther, Luther doesn't get over, but he's able to talk about it, and he, he's also able to talk about life as being fabulous. You know, he says, he's got other passages where he says, uh, if you just look at the world and how things operate, you just realize the devil has very little control of stuff. Like, we're not all dying every day. Um, uh, and so, uh, it's not that Luther's a pessimist or something. That's not what this is about. Yeah, one question, just to clarify, what, what Luther is doing by, by, um, by referring to Towler is that suffering is ubiquitous, that we all should be looking at the suffering, however, that we should also be looking at the suffering as part of the grace of God in his, his meaning God's, um, campaign to, to uh, seek us to forgive us. Yeah, which is why the redemption looks like cross and resurrection. I mean, you can't pretend that God's going to save you in a very different way than the way in which he treated his son. And all of us who are seeking after a, uh, uh, what is it, Thomas Kincaid, uh, fuzzy pink, uh, pink purple type of uh, salvation are going at it the wrong way. That's in a pond, man. Yeah, I mean, in spite of your little ichthus signature at the bottom, yeah, no, that's right. So now, how do you translate this for everybody? How do you just not make everybody hold up a standard that nobody can uh, experience? Does everybody have to go in and have this angst? You know, you read the, uh, the Augsburg Confession, and Melanchthon, more than anybody, talks about terrors of conscience. And I just don't see Melanchthon like hand-wringing terrors of conscience guy. You know, I just don't see that's his thing. And, and, you know, Luther is so exciting in the classroom talking about all this angst, but you, you can't, like, you don't have on Fechtung 101 in the classroom. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you translate an experiential thing? And so, I mean, I think Luther wisely moves, does not go the route of enthusiasm or any of these, these kinds of options that we're talking about, and instead stays laser-focused on the word and faith. With the, with, the, with the full expectation that word and faith will result in death and resurrection, in crucifixion uh, and, and the destruction of the flesh. And it has to, because that's, that's, we're not holding on to any generic word, but the word of Christ that's, that's promised to us. Um, so then what does that look like? So, the, so if people are not, um, if people are not, going to follow monasticism as a paradigm, but now it's kind of been inverted so that all lay life carries out true kind of religious expressions. What do you do? How do we read the scriptures? How do we pray? And, and reading the scriptures is, uh, you know, Luther has a lot to say about what to expect with the scriptures. And he uses, again, very mystical language. How many have read like Oswald Bayer? Uh, uh, where he, he talks, Oswald Bayer talks about promise as a uh, performative speech act. 
you know, like, um, so he uses modern linguistic theory from Steve Austin, who says that uh, there are certain kinds of words that we say that produce results as an act. Like, for instance, I now declare you man and wife, right? Uh, the act of saying that makes it so, creates a new relationship, or the judge hitting the gavel and saying, you are not guilty, that is a performative speech act. You don't have to do something else after that. This, the event actually is a speech event. So he uses that as an analogy to try to understand how Luther under, understands the effects of God's word. Luther uses the word actually tetelvort, that God's word is a deed word, that when he speaks, it doesn't just point to something, it makes something so, right? Just like we see in creation, that's why this creatio ex nihilo is really important. Um, but Luther, Luther didn't get a chance to read modern linguistic theory. So uh, instead, he uses the language of the mystics, again, which talk about the word like, like the word is a person. Well, isn't he, though? <laughs> um, and, and that the, and the, but no, that the word is a subject. So remember, we're talking about a theology of suffering, which means we're talking about a theology of passivity. Um, uh, to be passive... That uh, doesn't mean that you're inert. To be passive means, well, let's just use grammar. The passive sense uh, uh, is, is that you are the object of the verbs, not the subject of the verbs, right? That's what it means to be in a passive. Um, uh, so uh, when you say that your righteousness is passive or faith is passive, it doesn't mean that nothing's happening. There's a lot happening. It's just happening to you. You're not the subject of the verbs. God's the subject of the verbs, and you're the object of them. So you are suffering God. You are letting God do his thing to you. Um, uh, and so uh, this is what the word does to you. It, it, it is the subject, and we are the object of its work, um, which has a lot to do, it affects the way in which we approach the scriptures and what it means to interpret the scriptures. So for instance, oops, note well that the power of scripture is this, it will not be altered by the one who studies it. Instead, it transforms the one who loves it. It draws the individual in, into itself and into its own powers. That's 1514 in his very earliest lectures. Um, but it's that sentiment he wants to get across. He says again in 1516, and God thus changes us into his word, but not his word into us. And the word he's thinking of there is actually justitia, righteousness. Since these promises, this is one of my favorite. This is from Freedom of the Christian, 1520. Look at this language. It's all mysticism. Since these promises of God are holy, true, righteous, free, and peaceful words, full of goodness, the soul which clings to them with a firm faith will be so closely united with them and altogether absorbed by them that it will not only, it not only will share in all of their power, but it will be saturated and intoxicated by them. If a touch of Christ healed, how much more will the most tender spiritual touch, this absorbing of the word, communicate to the soul all things that belong to the word? So here's the difference between like enthusiasm and, and actually enthusiastic mysticism. The goal is union with God, in which we kind of ascend, strip away ourselves, ascend, and finally like knows like, and we become unified with God. But Luther has it completely, it's the word that unifies us with it, right? And then it gets really good. The word is the uterus in which human beings are conceived, carried, and born. Evangelium est mama, alvus dei. The gospel is the breast, the womb of God. So notice what it means to be passive. This is like he said, it means to be born. It means to be carried about by the word. And the word is this active agent. Now, I don't know how many people think that. I mean, in some sense, uh, you, uh, of course you all do. Um, and, and so, of course, lex orande, lex credendi, right? I mean, so that we, um, we actually all do act like that on Sunday. Because 
we all keep turning back to the same book. I mean, I've read War and Peace once, and I'm good, right? I mean, I know the main characters. I know the plot. I know where things are going. I don't need to go back to it again maybe in my entire life. Well, we don't read the scriptures because we just don't understand like, like information. Of course, it's, it's not that difficult. We can get the, the gist of the story and the main characters and all those sorts of things. But that's not why we attend to the scriptures day in and day out, week in and week out. We come and we, we expect something to happen. And it's not just getting info. We expect something to happen to us because we hear it again. Um, and so Luther is reflecting on that as, 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 as the central idea behind his whole passive righteousness of justification is passive. It happens through this word, letting the word kind of work on you. Um, which is again, so, so yes, yes, we interpret the word, but on another level, the word really interprets us. Uh, this isn't a method for exegesis. This is a posture towards scripture. Um, that has a certain, you have assumptions about what you expect to see. Uh, and, and it gives you a, an approach in the way you treat it. Right. Questions, comments? This is supposed to be descriptive of what happens to every Christian. You can't, you can't avoid it. You can't dodge it. This is going to happen. If you receive it in faith, yeah. you can always, I mean, you can always say, no, thank you. The, the problem with this is you, you can't be neutral with respect to it. Um, and, and not with every word, like Nimrod was a mighty hunter. Okay, I can be neutral to Nimrod was a mighty hunter. Um, uh, although I did use it in a sermon just to prove that you can preach that stuff. Um, but, but Luther is especially thinking of the, the, the language of promise, which... Um, which entire narratives make sense only in terms of their orientation to promise. But um, promise does something to you, right? You're, you, you, this is where the bondage of the will comes in. I went to a, uh, I went to a, uh, a debate between Christopher Hitchens and D'Souza. D'Souza? Remember Christopher Hitchens, the, the God is not great atheist and... They came to St. Louis and they had this kind of debate about like the, the, the moral benefits of believing in God or not. That was sort of the debate. And there's this great moment where D'Souza, of course, is not a Lutheran tradition, but he's arguing for Christian. And, and, uh, and Hitchens is like, I mean, how is any of this fair? You know, I never, uh, why can't God just say, you know, good job on being, you know, consistent with your convictions. Uh, I'll save you. No, it's got to be through Jesus. I got to believe in this guy. And, and D'Souza says, hey, now, no, no, don't, don't blame God for this. He's given you a choice, right? You, you could have freely chosen to follow Christ or not. Uh, uh, because Hitchens is sort of indicting God on this. And Zuzu wants to get God off the hook and says, uh, says no, you got, don't, don't forget about free will. And Christopher Hitchens says, what do you mean free will? There's no free will in Christianity. The die has been cast. As soon as God said salvation is through Christ, uh, I, there's no middle ground. You're either yes or no on this, right? You're backed into a corner. Um, so it was a fabulous moment because you're like, wow, you're either atheist or Lutheran. Those are no, there's no other option. <laughs> you know, you just, if you're going to be consistent, you're either, be, but in either way, it's the bondage of the will. And this is what a promise does. It backs you into a corner and it, and it calls for faith or unbelief. You cannot neutrally sort of ponder it, right? So, but, but once you're in that position, then, then it's exactly, that's, this is exactly the, the result. And of course, it doesn't happen magically. It happens precisely through what it's being said as it describes the one who died and rose again. Uh, and again, may, maybe you don't agree with this. I'm just kind of, on one level, I can do the historian's punt and say, this is what Luther says. You guys do what you want, um, but... but uh, but I, but I, do, I do think that this has shaped uh, much of what Luther, Luther writes later, his convictions about the reforms of, of worship, his reforms of, of, of preaching, the kind of thing that he's ex expecting people to do in preaching, his uh, 
his catechetical work, all of those things sort of work with this assumption. Well, what I mean is that Luther is not giving, this, giving us this. This is one of, of many different paths to God. He doesn't say that here. He's saying the exact opposite. This is, this is, this is how, if, if you are saved, it happens. Right. Because I just need to clarify some language for my sake, because we're using medieval mysticism, which makes me look at that and say, okay, what's wrong with it? Because I'm fully on board with that. And then we've got, you know, the enthusiastic mysticism that we want to be cautious about. And, and would it just be fair to say that, that in, you know, standard garden variety mysticism of the uh, enthusiastic variety is the quest for God to change us or to enter into us by some means other than the word or the sacrament? So uh, the, the big unique point here, um, medieval mystics and Reformation enthusiasts all want a unio with God directly. Apart from this means. And Luther, there's no, in fact, he, he does critique Towler on one thing. Towler has some famous Christmas sermons. And he says, this whole sermon, he has got these notes on, Luther's got, we have the marginal notes that he wrote on, on, on his collection of sermons. And he says, this whole sermon is about the birth of the, of the um, eternal word in the soul. Which, by the way, you know, you, you have these in your Christmas colics, right? You got three births going on at Christmas in, all, in the three Christmas masses. It's still in your lectionary and in your colics. The birth of God from, uh, in history, the birth of God in the soul, and the eternal generation of the, of, of the Son from the Father. It's all, in your, it's all in your lectionary and your colics, which is why you end with John 1. Um, so that goes all the way back to Innocent III um, in the Middle Ages. That's when uh, the triplex nativitas and the, and the threefold birth of Christ at Christmas is brought about. So Towler's just preaching on that, and he's talking about the eternal birth of God in the soul, of the word in the soul. And Luther says, that's all speculative theology. Proper theology is all about the birth of the incarnate word. And so Luther rejects the idea that one could ever find union with God apart from the enfleshment of the word in Christ and in his promises in the word itself. So this is distinguishes it. It's not union with God. It's union with Christ, i.e. union with his word. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, so it's this, this external means by which you find connection with God. There is no direct connection with God. That's That's... That's what, uh, uh, that's, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's idolatry. That's idolatry, yeah. Uh, you're talking, I, I'm just running to the rail right now, and I, I'm communing with my, my, my Savior. He's right there in, in his word, in flesh incarnate. I, sounds good to me. Well, I mean, this is, uh, this is why then the word becomes the central focus of the Eucharist, too. Uh, because there is Eucharistic mysticism, um, but it's not Luther's view of the of the sacrament. It's the it's the mysticism of the word that that makes the the sacrament kind of what it is in Luther's thought. But, but there's some, some it's probably using a different term, but mysticism in that we're worshiping with angels and archangels. We look around, we don't see those angels around. Oh, oh, sure. But but that's not necessarily good news. Right? right. I mean, being in the heavenly courts right. could really suck <laughs> if you're on the wrong side of that. You know, it's like it's like this. It's like re Christ's resurrection is not self-evidently good news. He could be doing a Schwarzenegger and coming back uh, to get those who abandoned him and those who. But he doesn't. He comes back and he gives you a word to accompany his event, to accompany his work. And the word is peace be with you, right? And um, so the sacrament, I mean, Luther believed in the true presence of Christ and the angels and archangels standing before the divine judgment throne. And it was a terrifying, horrible experience, right? It only is good news because there's a promise that this is for you, for the forgiveness of sins, right? Peace be with you. Uh, that's what makes it what it is. Just a couple of thoughts here on, on prayer. So these are the big questions. If it's not going to be, uh, if it's not going to be monastic prayer, 
or if monasticism somehow is sort of shaped by lay life, uh, or if the true religious life is also the tr is, is common person life, how do we pray? How do we use the word of God? And you can see Luther's answers to how we pray r really does focus on those kinds of questions, like the, you know, the simple way to pray to Peter the Barber. I mean, he, does, he, uh, he, he sets in contrast kind of the, the formality of the monastic life with, okay, think about your vocation. Think about the Ten Commandments in relationship to the vocation. Let the Lord's Prayer shape it. And even the catechism prayers has the same sort of function. Rather than doing sort of the, he, you know, Luther doesn't tell you to go do matins. Sorry, guys. Matins and nuns and vespers and all those things, which we stole from the Anglicans, by the way. Um, uh, uh, there's no Lutheran matins. But, but uh, that's fine. Um, but Luther, for, for in the catechism, he gives, he gives the common person a a daily office that's structured about their common life uh, rather than an, um, uh, an quasi-artificial structure where you every three hours do something. It's get up. When you wake, you fill that time with prayer and God's word. When you walk to work, you sing a hymn about God's word. When you sit down and eat, you fill that time with prayer and God's word. And when you go to bed at night, you do the same. And so the rhythm of, of lay life is filled with its own sort of daily office. And that's, that's sort of the purpose of those prayers. And they're not prayers that he invents. You know, he, he pulls them from the tradition, but he gives, he, he says, you know, at, at minimum, here's your structure. Fill your days uh, with the rhythm of your day is filled with, with, uh, with prayers in these logical spots. Um, and then, of course, you know, the central prayer text for monastic life was the Psalter, and Luther gives that uh, to the lay person as well. And I mentioned this, I won't go in, in great detail, but here's from the preface of his German translation of the Psalters, and look how he uh, replaces the lives of the saint literature with, with the Psalms. He says, over the years, a great many legends of the saints and passionals and books of examples and histories have been circulated. Indeed, the world has been so filled with them that the Psalter has been neglected. I hold, however, that no finer book of examples or the legends of the saints has ever come or can come to earth than the Psalter. If one were to wish that from all the examples, legends, and histories, the best should be collected, brought together, you'd get the Psalter. For here we find not only what one or two saints have done, but what he has done, who is the very head of the saints. And we also find what all the saints still do, such as the attitude they take toward God, towards friends and enemies, the ways they conduct themselves amid dangers and sufferings. The Psalter ought to be a precious and beloved book, if for no other reason than this, it promises Christ's death and resurrection so clearly and pictures his kingdom and condition of nature of all Christendom, it might well be called a little Bible. But beyond that, the Psalter has this noble virtue and quality. Other books make much ado about the works of the saints, but say very little about their words. But the Psalter is a gem in this respect. It gives so forth so sweet a fragrance when one reads it because it relates not just the works of the saints, but also their words, how they spoke with God and prayed and still speak and pray. Compared to the Psalter, the other legends and examples present to us nothing but mere silent saints. The Psalter, however, pictures for us real, living, active saints. And then he goes out and he, he talks about how uh, life is full of ups and downs, basically. He talks about the human heart as a ship being tossed about on the seas. And the Psalms all reflect this. You have Psalms of great anguish, which are there for you in your time of anguish. And you have times of joy. You have Psalms of great joy. And then at the end, so he says, the book of saints is for everyone. It's a book for all the saints in whatever situation he may be, finds in that situation psalms and words that fit his case as if they were written just for his sake. And then he says, and I love this, this also serves well another purpose. When these words please a man and fit his case, he becomes sure that he is in the communion of the saints and that it goes with all the saints as it goes with him since they all sing this one little song. This, it's a secure and well tried guide, all the other literature on the saints uh, you might follow with peril. 
The other examples in Legends of Saints present works that one is unable to imitate. They present even more works which it is dangerous to imitate, works that usually start sects and divisions and lead and tear men away from the communion of the saints. But the Psalter holds you to the communion of the saints and away from the sects, for it teaches you in joy, fear, hope, and sorrow to think and speak as all the saints have thought and spoken. In a word, if you would see the Holy Christian Church painted in living color and shape, comprehended in one little picture, and take up the Psalter. So Luther gives the central monastic text to the entire church and says, this is your, don't follow all of these, these uh, other devotional, popular devotional tracts. I give you a prayer book, right? This is it. And it, it holds you to, to the communion of saints. It brings comfort and it gives you security knowing that uh, uh, you are speaking the words that Christ spoke who is the head of the saints, and all the rest of the church speaks. Um, so that's prayer. Um, then I do want to touch just briefly on now, how, do lay how are lay people to read the scriptures? And this is not like a devotional like pattern, um, but this is the question. Well, are we supposed to well, how do the monks read? They do the Lectio Divina. Lectio, Oratio, Meditatio, Contemplatio. Right? To read, to pray, to meditate, and to contemplate. And that's a, that's a, those are stages. You know, there's a, there's a process. You read, and then from that text brings you into prayer, and then into meditation. Of course, meditation is interesting, where Scripture is sort of the springboard for your own meditation. Sometimes... You see in the Franciscans in particular, this effort to try to read yourself into the story. Um, there's some famous Franciscan sermons, uh, Christmas sermons, where you, like, what, what would it be like to be like the, the donkey in the manger scene, right? Uh, or, or better than the donkey, what would it be like to be the manger, to hold Christ? And so you, meditation on Scripture doesn't really attend to the message of Scripture, but Scripture becomes this own disconnected image for our own sort of imaginations. And then from that kind of meditation is this, that, that helps you to forget the world in which you actually live and the temptations that you actually deal with. It removes you from that and it moves you up to a higher plane. So there is a sense in which lectio, oratio, meditatio, tentatio is this ascent that begins with the scriptures and then lifts you beyond the world into uh, union with God, which is the ultimate goal of, of contemplation. It follows the traditional monastic three stages of, of uh, purgation, illumination, and, and unification. But Luther, if, if you remember, um, people kept trying to publish Luther's writings. And someone was talking about this at lunch, like what was, the, if anything was left He'd keep, what, the catechism and the, and the bondage of the will. You have a lot of these lists where Luther says, I wish all of my writings would be burned and be lost, except the catechism, that thing I wrote against Erasmus, that was awesome. <laughs> um, Galatians commentary. Sometimes he says Deuteronomy uh, commentary, which, by the way, if you're looking for a dissertation topic, no one's written on that yet. Um, so... Uh, uh, but why, the big effort is, and this has been happening from early on, is trying to collect his writings. And Luther protests against it, and it's on the same reason every time. He says, the problem has been that we filled our libraries with books other than Scripture. And we've spent, he says, there is no other book uh, that we have so easily mastered as the Scriptures. You read it once, you put it down, now, like, now what do I really want to read, right? He says sarcastically. And so wouldn't it be a great irony of the Reformation if the great legacy of the Reformation is that we all read Luther's writings instead of the scriptures, right? Of course, none of us listen to him. Um, but so he protests against this because he says precisely what he's against. He's, he's offered the scriptures to people now. Why would anybody want to read his stuff? So in his first major collection, the German writings, Luther writes a preface and he says, he makes all of these protestations and then says, so I'm going to use the rest of the preface to teach you how to read the scriptures, not how to read my writings. 
And then he says, he says, there are three rules for reading the scriptures. And he, the preface is in German, but all of a sudden he throws in these three Latin words. And of course, if you're familiar with Alexio Divina, they sound very familiar. He says, there's three, to read the scriptures, you do oratio, meditatio, tentatio. <clears throat> oratio we know pretty well. Prayer, meditation, okay. But what's this tentatio business? And as you read the text, you realize that he's taking the, the traditional Lexio Divina, which moves from scripture as an ascent away from the world, and instead kind of inverts the whole thing. So that um, it's, a, it's a Lexio Divina for people who are in the world. So he says, he describes it very clearly. First, you pray for the Holy Spirit to come. So rather than ascent, you're, at, you're expecting a descent, right? God to, to enter into you. Give the Holy Spirit so that you will never understand the scriptures without the Holy Spirit. So you pray for the Holy Spirit. And then you meditate on the word. And meditation on the word isn't to take it as an, a, an illustration for some personal imagination, uh, disconnected from the context or the message of scripture. But no, you throw yourself into it. You chew on it. You meditate it. You cross-reference. You try to, Luther sees the whole enterprise of learning Greek and Hebrew and everything in, under that umbrella of meditation. So it's a very different, it's a, it's a scripture-oriented meditation. And then, tentatio. Uh, on fechtum. Well, what's that? Well, then life happens. Then you will experience something that fundamentally contradicts what you just read. You will, you will, you have enemies from without and enemies from within. And whatever it is, you will experience people who hate you. You will experience cancer. You will experience your own sense of sin. And all of those things will seem to point that God has abandoned you. And on the one hand, you have this word that's, you have these lavish promises. Never let your foot hit against a stone. God will let his angels watch over you. And on the other hand, looks like God forgot me in, the, in those promises. Because what's going on in my life. And so then you're in that, that position. And so what does Luther say? Pray and go back to those promises. And so you just have this, you never get above and beyond life in the world. Instead, it's all about God's sort of bringing his word into your life. And then as you sort of deal with the trials of life, God allows those te that, that temptation, that tentatio to drive you deeper into his word, drive you deeper to faith, um, cling more uh, severely to the promises of God. Um, and so he sees that's the rhythm of life. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's one that takes seriously the difficulties of life and yet takes more seriously the words that may even seem to contradict it. So, so Luther's got that really great piety. You know, you fight God against God. I think God's against me, but I'm going to hold him to his promise and rub his ears in it, he says, right? I am baptized. You guys are familiar with this, of course, um, but just trying to put some of our familiar texts in, into, their, into this larger context of how he's taking uh, his own monastic uh, view of things, seeing it as a framework for pastoral care and expanding it out uh, to all of Christianity. At what point did, does he make this transition? I mean, I, I, I think it has a, probably has a great to deal to do with his theological base and understanding because as it, I, I've always seen, which is hanging behind me in, in my study, oratio, meditatio, tentatio, as law, gospel, life. Law, gospel, life. Oratio is law. Prayer, in other words, who's running the verbs? You're, you know, who's doing the doing in this action? Certainly, as you pray, you are confessing. The prayer, and that is not necessarily what takes place in, in, in the answer to it, which is the promise being applied and then taken into life. And I, I could be totally off base. It's just that, yeah. that where I, I have been with that. I mean, it's it's not it's not wrong. It's just that I would I would take the law gospel and put them both under meditatio. Because, uh, I mean, when Luther explains this, he says, we pray because 
uh, this is a divine book, not a human book, and we need the Spirit. I mean, it's a specific prayer for the Holy Spirit. That's, the, that's what he says explicitly. In, in, this is in his preface in 1534 in his German writings. And then the meditation then would be really what the scriptures are trying to, this is where those earlier passages, what scripture does to us, right? So, I mean, you are right. The prayer is a, con is a confession of humility. I can't do this without you, right? I can't read or understand this on my, with my own reason or strength, but I pray that the Holy Spirit would come to me. Yeah, um, so you're praying that not only that the scripture would be clear externally, because it is, but that it would be clear internally, uh, which is this work of the Spirit alone. Um, Even though it does take faith, you know, the faith that is in me, it, it, it's still a sacrificial act. Yeah, it yeah. is one who is going pleading for mercy and direction. Right. And so, again, under the law. Yeah, I mean, yes, it depends on why you're praying. I mean, it's bo they're both there. Well, I'm going to read the Bible. I better pray because I know my own reason will get in the way. Or I get to hear the voice of God. Lord, be present with me. I don't know if both of those are law. The pray, even in praise, it's still sacrificial. Well, and think about, think about how he, he in, the, in the catechism, how he describes why we should pray. He says, you should pray because God commanded it. But he's also promised great things in it. So you should also pray because he's promised great things. So which is it, law or gospel? Yes. Uh, yes. Right. I mean, he, I mean, so sometimes, and it's interestingly, sometimes the, command, the fact that it's commandment is a great source of consolation. In his writings to people who uh, are speculating about predestination, he says, stop speculating about predestination because God commands you not to. So just take comfort in the fact that you haven't been given the commandment to speculate, right? And so you kind of hold on to the commandment as this kind of good news. Yeah, but I, I would continue, <laughs> you, you can't say the both end in that particular case. You have jumped over to the meditatio. What do you uh, when, 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 when you ask that, that doesn't fall under the realm of prayer. The realm of prayer remains in sacrificial theology. It, it, you, it, where, where you said both just right now, actually you describe both, but you're, you've all of a sudden made the jump into meditatio, which is gift. Where, 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 where the gospel is delivered and promises received. Uh, all I'm saying is, I was referring to the, the catechism, right? Is, is that what you're talking about? Well, the, the, the quick response on, on the yes and the both, no, that, that wasn't what I was re referring to. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, you always help me clarify what I Okay, yeah. Please. Well, I'm just thinking, it's, you know, maybe if, maybe if you take as your starting point a, a redefinition of prayer and putting it soundly in the realm of a, of a receptive spirituality, that prayer is simply a manifestation of faith, which itself is a gift, seeking the promises of God. So if you experience prayer as, as receptive spirituality, then it is. I mean, Luther talks about prayer that way in the, Lord's, in, in the Catechism on the Lord's Prayer, that it's faith. So trust in, right, trust in God goes to the Word, which you take to life. Life beats you down, so faith in God takes you to the Word, which... It absolutely is yet no means, right? Right, and that way faith is, and prayer become synonymous. No means, what prayer, means? grace. Prayer. Yeah, prayer. No, prayer is not a means of grace. Um, but prayer is an, ex it's an, it's a, an act of faith. It's a fruit of faith. Cannot be done apart from it. Right, right. Rick Stuckwich has a, has a really nice small book on this, on Melanchthon and the Eucharistic sacrifice um, of prayer. Prayer as, prayer as a sacrifice. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not sure how that's, um, I don't disagree. I'm just trying to figure out with, with respect, because we were talking about law and gospel. Right, right. And, and Luther will, uh, like for instance in the catechism, he will use the fact that it's commanded and the fact that it also gives great promises as motivating factors for why one should pray. Right, and so one is obedience to a law. Another one is a response to what a gift might be given in response to prayer. God promises to hear us. He promises to answer our prayer, all of those sorts of things. Well, my, in, 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 in hearing those promises and believing them, the prayer that comes out of that faith isn't a response to law, but it's a response to the promises that God is gonna be my heavenly father and listen to me like he listens to a child. 
Um, on the other hand, if I'm sort of resentfully, um, should I pray or not? Luther says, well, of course you should pray because even if you don't want to, it's commanded, right? I don't know, are we speaking about two different things? Uh, like, it seems like we have two different dogs in the hunt uh, on this. Like, you're trying to safeguard something. Oh, I, I'm not. I'm just trying to say my, my historical thought process and understanding of oratio meditatio tentatio. And yeah, I, I mean, I've seen it in, in the law gospel paradigm that moves us out into life. And I, uh, and, and it, I guess it, it, it is wrong. You know, it, and the thing that has brought me to that, of course, is, uh, of, again, maybe very misled, but, uh, but the, uh, the sacramental, sacrificial theology that kind of runs everything and, and brings you into a law gospel paradigm. And, and since prayer falls under the category, even in the six chief parts uh, uh, of, we'll say, sacrificial theology or the works uh, that come under the law, e even praying of the Lord's Prayer is something that are, where I am the active agent in the doing, and it merits me absolutely nothing. But it is an act of praise and faith that engages, but that is still an act that falls under the law in sacrificial theology. Yeah, first table of the law in, in particular. Uh, it's, it's not a hill to die on. No, no, no. No, I mean, this is, I, I think, and partly, partly what I think maybe we're touching on too is the, the great, I mean, the great mystery of the first commandment, which is both law and promise. I mean, Luther talks about the first commandment as the greatest of promises. So is the first commandment gospel or is it law? And, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's the promise that God will be my God, that he wants to be my God. And uh, it also uh, is a promise that um, if he's truly going to be my God, that there's nothing I can contribute to this, this divinity. Um, so Luther will talk very, very clearly uh, about first commandment being a promise, and then also talking about it as the law that brings everybody to his knees. So, I mean, in some sense, prayer falls under that category where prayer is obviously clearly an act, a human act. So it's not the gospel. It's not God working upon me. It's not a means of grace. On the other hand, it's, it's not just a, it's not a response to a command always. It's also a, res a response of faith to a promise. It's still active righteousness, as Luther says, proper righteousness, but it's not. Um, but usually when you think of law and gospel, the way you're describing it, I was thinking second use of law, that condemns us, well, I'm not sure if we pray because of its condemnation of us. You know, we pray out of response to promises, too. But, I mean, you just look at this, uh, the, the preface uh, to the 1534 uh, thing, and he just kind of lays out, he says, it's, he says it's David's rules, right, from Psalm 119, because David's always asking for the gift of the Spirit, always meditating upon your law day and night, and always asking for deliverance from his enemies. So we were, we, were, uh, we were kind of playing around with this one a little bit for a, for a while here. Um, we had, I think, a very helpful discussion and, uh, about the role of personal experience and the external experience of the word. But you know, again, <clears throat> Luther, this is a famous phrase of Luther, and it's not the only place where Luther says this. He says it quite frequently, sola experientia theologum facet, that only experience makes a theologian. Um, now, he doesn't mean like the school of hard knocks, although kind of, um, but he means in the context of the word. So in experience with the scriptures, and then uh, the contradiction of life, which brings about the possibility of holding on to the scriptures even more tightly, um, that's the experience that he's talking about. Um, and he's got an interesting uh, approach to the word, this this this. This, this notion that the church before the word is a mendicant, full of expectation, full of uh, kind of in a, in a passive state, uh, waiting for God to do something, has an impact on how he understands his own work as an interpreter of scripture, which I think is instructive for us. So um, in 1519, he publishes his very first commentary on Galatians. It's the first major exegetical publication that he sets forth at the end of the preface, he says, I've had one thing in view. May I bring it about that through my work, those who have heard me explaining the epistles of the apostle may find Paul clearer and happily surpass me. 
And this is, I, we had talked at lunch, this uh, to me is one of the main differences between Luther and Calvin, for instance. Calvin's commentaries are, are trying to kind of give, trying to, Calvin's trying to remove himself as far as possible from the exegetical task and leave these commentaries as a legacy. Um, just like he does with his institutes. Leaves them as a legacy for other people to refer to. And frankly, he did a pretty good job. I mean, I, I can still go to Calvin's commentaries and find some pretty decent exegetical insights, just are just intertextual. Um, but Luther doesn't have that expectation about his exegetical work. His expectation is that what he's doing now is for those now. And he expects people to surpass him in the work. His exegetical work is not a legacy that people should constantly refer to. It's the work of a theologian in the 16th century. Um, and then comes the 17th century. And you better have another theologian doing it. Um, and this is not just a one-off. He says this repeatedly. This is, this is from uh, uh, his actual final sentence in his recorded lectures on Genesis, which he lectured on for 10 years. The last line, this is my dear Genesis. May our Lord God give to us somebody else who can do this better than me. Uh, but I can't do any more, I'm weak. Orate, orate Deum pro me. Pray to God for me that he might give me a good and holy end. Um, and in between, Luther makes these lines kind of repeatedly. Uh, my favorite is from his Operationis in Psalmus. You know, he says that after he learned the gospel, he turned back to the Psalms again, thinking he could do a better job the second time around. And this is from the preface. And he says, now, this is going to blow your mind, but I think it's an important text. I am quite unwilling that anyone should presume to expect that from me, which no one of the most holy and most learned of the fathers could ever yet pretend to do, that I should understand and teach the Psalms in all respect according to their real sense and meaning. It is enough that some men understand some parts of them. The Holy Spirit always reserves much to himself in order that he may keep us learners under him. We are passive uh, under the word. We're never masters of it. You'll never master it. Wherefore, it becomes candidly to confess that I know not whether or not mine is to a certainty the true meaning of the Psalms, though I nevertheless hold no doubt that what I have delivered is truth. What is he saying in his preface? You're about to read a commentary on the Psalms. I can't guarantee that I've exegeted them correctly, but, they're tr but my, my interpretation is true. So there's a distinction between uh, exegesis and doctrinal conclusions or what, what's orthodox and what's, there's a, parameter, there's a parameter there that he's laying out. And then he says, at last I came to this opinion that no man's interpretation, provided it be a godly one, which is interesting, should be rejected unless he that rejects it submit himself to the lex talionis. One man may fall short in many things and another in more. I may see many things which Augustine did not see and I am persuaded that others will see many things which I do not now see. And so Luther's posture to the scripture also, uh, also shapes his understanding of the limits of exegesis and interpretation and, and how much one can expect to accomplish in one's lifetime even. So that when you get to his very last thing that he ever wrote, and this is the final slide, because it's the last thing he ever wrote, um, which you all know. Um, but it's about experience, isn't it? He starts by thinking about classical texts. Um, and Virgil was his favorite author. You know, Virgil is it's like the Harry Potter of the 16th century. I mean, he had to give up everything he had before he went to the monastery, but he took one book with him and it was Virgil. No one can understand the Bucolics of Virgil unless he's been a shepherd for five years and no one can understand the Georgics unless he's been a farmer for five years. In other words, these poetic texts are talking about life as a farmer and a shepherd. You're not gonna understand them unless you have that experience first. No one understands Cicero and his letters unless he's been engaged in some aspect of the state for 20 years. But then here's the real point. No one should believe that he's even tasted the Holy Scriptures sufficiently unless he's governed churches for a hundred years with the prophets. Thus was it such a great miracle with John the Baptist, Christ, and the apostles. Lay not your hand on this divine Aeneid. Bow before it and adore its every trace. 
We are beggars. This is true. I mean, notice, <clears throat> we are not masters of this text. He is not expecting anyone, even a hundred years working with the scriptures, you will never, you'll just barely taste it. This is an inter, trans, trans uh, generational, this is, a, this is a work of the church. Not of any one generation or any one theologian masters the scriptures. They work on it, they, they bring about the telos, which is faith, and then the next generation does the same thing. And they bring around the telos, that's faith, and the next generation does the same thing. And at no point are you ever a master. We are a mendicant church. We are a beggar church. And we beg uh, not for alms, but for uh, what the Lord gives us in his word. That's why we don't have any Karl Barths. I mean, except our, your, your far, former colleague. You know, on the one hand, that seems, I, I mean, immediately I'm struck by the deep humility and, and the beauty of such a statement. On the other hand, I can't help but be a little concerned about the fluidity that it suggests of the scriptures and their interpretation in any given different time and place. Hence the ongoing interpretation brought to us by the historical critical method. Well, the his, the or maybe that's not a good example. Yeah. But. That's not a good example because the assumptions of the historical critical method contradict all the assumptions that make this humility possible. Take a different one. How about everyone's entitled to their own interpretation of the scriptures? In any age, are we all entitled to our own interpretation as an evolving understanding of the scripture? It seems like there's... I mean, again, I'm not sure entitled is probably the best route to go. Um, uh, you have to go to the previous slide, the one where he says, if he be of... Uh, what is a godly, a god. So, uh, it just seems like he's giving us license. What did the last generation of pastors preach about? Let's. I mean, let's. Let's. Uh, I think you only have two options. One is that you master the scriptures, uh, or you never master the scriptures. And if you never master the scriptures, then you can assume that you will not see everything that another generation might see. Um, but you already said you, no other generation is going to see everything anyway. No, but you can build off of it. You can contradict. You can move through things. We've seen things in the scriptures. And of course, we've recognized this as a church body, even in our confessional subscription in which we subscribe, not to the particulars of exegesis, but to the doctrinal conclusions that the exegesis has set forth. We've never taken a position on this is what this text specifically means in, a, in an absolute sense. But, uh, I mean, even apart from that, I think the idea is not that any old interpretation is possible. That would mean that you're a master of the text. <clears throat> but you certainly can't master the text. You know, you're always in a, in a, a recipient state. I'm a recipient from, from fathers before me who have taught me things, my own teachers at the seminary. Um, you know, and remember, we have, the, we have the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture, but it's not the clarity of every single passage. It, the Scripture as a whole is clear, but, you know, Luther's quite clear that there are passages that the Holy Spirit has reserved for himself and that I cannot pretend to understand fully, right? And so what do you do? You confess the Holy Spirit knows better than I do, and I stay a student of him as long as I live, and maybe he'll let me peer into it. And if not, maybe someone else will. So... Uh, yeah, as soon as you flip it and say, oh, this gives me license to say whatever the heck I want, you've just thrown out every assumption that he made of being passive before the word, right? Uh, hey, thank you very much for your attention, your interest, uh, your conversation. This was a lot of fun. It was good to be with you, and I look forward to the rest of the...